after some discussion they have figured out some core elements of the game like interactive problem solving uh, for example interaction is very important uh, between the player and play game uh, uh, player and game uh, during the play game and uh, there should be some their uh, specific goals or rules for example um, uh, goals or rules like when player should do what to do what not to do uh, these uh, goals are very important for the game and adaptive ch challenges that uh, there should be some uh, levels which 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 should be um, according to the abilities of uh, the player um, uh, uh, level of difficulties it, it should not exceed the ability of the student so it should not be too easy to to play or the control and control uh, it is very important that uh, players should ha have uh, uh, control over the game like environment like control on um, the learning experience and every and other elements and ongoing feedback it, it is very important uh, when we uh, talk in terms of learning because when a player has uh, timely feedback uh, uh, from the game then uh, it is very uh, it it, uh, it helps in uh, in making in making in, in, in it interactive and uncertainty increases the evokes suspense so it also increases the interaction with the game and the sense stimuli includes the graphics the sounds uh, 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 which uh, which uh, uh, stimulates the, the senses of the player to in increase the involvement. Next slide. Yes, uh, then they have uh, tried to um, uh, explain the four examples of learning from the digital games, uh, learning uh, deep learning in civilization, uh, game master mechanic and system thinking, ep epistemic games, uh, it, it take a park and science content and again and then uh, in the coming slides uh, I will discuss them in detail. Deep learning civilization there are a number of games that um, uh, uh, that are civilization game where that player has to start their own civilization and then uh, they have to um, uh, uh, advance in from the stone age to the um, uh, future uh, Future zone like future uh, like the era having future technologies and uh, it is uh, mainly used to for the learning of the history, but the player needs to consider the important elements of human history, um, including the economy, growth, geography, culture, technology, advancement, and the war. The example of uh, uh, these kind of games are is uh, which is described in the state paper is civilization. Uh, the same that uh, must, uh, player has to start their own civilization. They can choose the, which civilization they want to start, and they have to uh, uh, um, create a population, and they have to stable it, and they have to uh, um, initiate some wars, and they have to take some very important decision. So uh, they have been studied that uh, in many researches they have. Concluded that uh, the games like this help students in learning some historical facts. Next slide. Yes, uh, the system thinking games uh, it involves uh, seeing the big picture and the whole scenario, and then uh, take, uh, to, uh, and then um, uh, seeing the big picture and considering the um, uh, other all elements, the parameters involving the game, and then. Um, in considering them and then try to figure out the uh, solution or uh, problem uh, uh, solution. The players need to think hard about the various game elements, parameters, and their interaction, uh, interrelation, like game master mechanic. In, in this example, uh, this game is used to uh, teach the design skills, game design skills to the students. Uh, in this uh, game, the students can design their own game and they can create a, a game from the start and they have to consider the many the parameters and elements like the rules or goals of the games and every, each and everything. If so, they have to think too hard. If they will think simply, then uh, they, uh, they will miss something and uh, the game will not be 
uh, proper game or it could not uh, 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 result in a um, good so it can be used uh, it you know, like games like this can be used uh, to learning uh, to for the learning of the system thinking thinking game as a system thinking game like that epistemic uh, systemic games uh, the knowledge skills values and identities that are for particular professional community for example if you want your player to think act and perform like a engineer then uh, these games are used for that for example uh, the players need to think hard about various game elements, parameters, and their interrelations. And uh, the urban sciences example where, where the, they are uh, they have to um, player uh, work as an intern in an original planning uh, commun uh, um, company, and they have to plan the, uh, the communities for the people. But for uh, for this, they have to first make a visit. A site visit and then ask to some virtual uh, uh, people about their requirements then they have to plan according to them some needs that there are some needs more affordable housing so th they have to consider um, uh, all uh, uh, these parameters and element to um, implement it uh, this is science content learning in which students has to players has to make the some uh, make their um, uh, clear scientific uh, concepts. Kids learn from uh, science and uh, science content and inquiry skills. Players need to understand how certain science concepts are related to each other. And the, uh, this uh, this was explained by the help of this exam uh, this example uh, game in which there were some uh, groups that were coexisting uh, co coexisting in the game for example there could be a lumber com uh, company or fishing company and uh, a player can be asked to uh, to solve a problem like uh, to check why fishing fish are dying in the pond they have to uh, investigate uh, like the check the water quality from one, one side of the river and another side of the river like checking the temperature like other things so they have to first understand uh, what um, the science behind uh, this and then uh, uh, find out the solution for this type of learning. Then, uh, and now we have to um, check how the assessment uh, in the games can be done. Uh, the first study that the getting injured reduces the, the like things like this can also be used in the assessment uh, like getting injured reduces the health. Finding a treasure inventory uh, increase the inventory of the goods, solve major problem, some problem, and their level will be up. So, um, uh, for the overall assessment, general assessment, these kind of things can be used for um, assessment in the games. But uh, they have proposed uh, some evidence center design, uh, which is a framework used to develop the assessment models. It is based on the evidence, uh, uh, evidence like uh, that happens during the interaction of the player uh, in the gameplay, and uh, this is to increase the quality and utility of the assessment. And they have proposed uh, uh, some models in this framework, like uh, competency, evidence, and task models, which I will explain. The competency competency model consists of the student related variables like knowledge, skill, and other attributes. Uh, if we um, take example, like if uh, uh, it helps to make some claims about the students' abilities, like uh, related to their knowledge, skills, and attributes. If uh, someone want to make a claim that a student is very good in making the Microsoft presentations slides, then uh, they have to consider the technical as well as uh, design skills. But uh, if so, uh, if a uh, student is uh, low in design and good in technical side, then they can claim that the student is medium. So this helps. Uh, <coughs> this helps in uh, making the claims about these student abilities. Uh, next slide. Uh, evidence and task model in the ECD framework uh, specifies the activities or conditions under which the data are collected. 
like in uh, the same example in Microsoft PowerPoint that uh, the actions and the products uh, will be used as the assessment in this model. What um, uh, players doing and what uh, the end result will help in assessment. Uh, reasons why the SD framework fits well with the assessment of the learning. Uh, because the people learn in action uh, um, and the assessment is an evidentiary argument. We cannot say that we cannot uh, assess the from the in general but uh, we cannot assess in general the game what student had learned because it's very difficult to uh, check what students uh, has actually learned so the um, uh, in this model the assessment is done on the basis of the events that happens during the gameplay so uh, this is model fits for um, assessment for the research still the assessment is the that the assessment should not be visible uh, because if it is visible that it will uh, um, it will reduce the engagement of the player in the game and it it should be like woven directly and invisibly in, invisibly into the fabric of the learning environment in traditional answer to each question is seen as an independent data point but uh, Actually, uh, it is not uh, right because uh, it depends on what time, what action a, a player has done. So the next coming uh, actions depend on the previous uh, mm, actions. So uh, any actions during the, the gameplay is uh, dependent on them. So we cannot uh, uh, say um, confidently that uh, the data we get at a point is can be used for the assessment. And the two year the particular or uh, individual piece of knowledge or skill, one question and one fact. Uh, for the traditional uh, method, uh, they uh, we can just uh, assess a few, uh, uh, like one question will represent one fact. We can find out one fact. But in the ECD, or in the like ECD used in, as a still assessment. We can uh, uh, assess the bundle of skills and abilities at one at one time. Next time. So, uh, in the conclusion, they have discussed some um, uh, limitation for the ECT model, like the level of granularity is very important to be implemented in the assessment. Uh, like the large screen size, the less specific evidence. We uh, uh, we are not sure about uh, the evidence if the uh, green size is large, but if, if it is so fine, but then it will be so complex to assess. And also the development of the ICD is uh, cost is high. Um, that's it. Why am I going to here? <laughs> Why can't I make that go away? Like, no. Something you made or can you resize the, the fonts? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's amazing. If I make it too big, suddenly it this becomes, becomes too big as well. Enormous. Yeah. It suddenly Rats and mm. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> some questions. Um, so, so sh shall we shall we go through those questions? And, yeah, I think okay. so. So, um, which core elements of a well-designed game um, games do exist, and um, 
and what each of them means. Well, so basically, I assume this question uh, is asking about what the elements of a well-designed game, or good games, um, and, and what yeah, what elements exist, and what do they what the elements do? So, and to some extent, that's that's from your slides. Mm -hmm. um, if we have a look back up here. Right, core elements of games. So one of the questions is, um, do we think that that's a good list? Is it missing something? Is it got something that we don't think should be there? So yeah. not wrong. Because <laughs> we had, a, I had an interesting question from Morton um, at the, the, the PAD thing, which was, uh, he was saying, well, um, can you take the serious games and Instead of instead of developing a game for something, can you take a game and remove elements to try and work out which of the elements are affected? And, and that sort of sits at this: if you remove one of these from the game, what does that tell you about the importance of that element? And does it actually say anything about that element, or does it say something about the system of interactions that are going on? All right. So. What are your thoughts? Could, could you remove one and have a game and then see what it's like without one of those in it? It really depends on what element it is. If you remove the controls, then... If you remove the <laughs> control, I suppose interactive, one, one and four would have difficulty removing one without the other. Right? If you have no control, how do you interact? Um, if there is no control. And if you had no control, would it feel like a game? Or is this watching someone else play? If you could, because yeah, um, when, I, when I watch Rachel play, she doesn't like me saying anything. Right? She, she, uh, you, I don't know, you guys, uh, when you're playing a game, solitaire or a game, do you like or dislike someone making a suggestion? I hate it. Okay, who, who, who hates someone making a suggestion on their solitaire <laughs> game? And who is indifferent, doesn't care? <laughs> and who likes it? <laughs> I like when people suggest things because it feels like they're trying to help, and I think that's lovely. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just as annoying as people, you know, trying to, you know, yeah, paint your mouth and do stuff on your computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, one of, one of the one of the rules we had uh, when I was tutoring at Otago. Um, I had to beat out of my tutors was um, one of the rules we had was you never touch the, the, the student's mouse. Right? You instruct, but you never take over. Because if you take over, they don't learn, you show them how clever you are. Um, so they, they can only learn if they're still in control. Right? So control, for tutoring control was still quite a big issue. Um, uh, the, to me, the problems with these are not that they don't describe a game, but they describe much more than games. Yes. So, what do I they mean, most, most good interactive systems should <laughs> offer all that. Games yes. or not. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you looked at, a, at a, a, a course at university, right? Let's say there's a, a, a standard database course. Um, is there interactive problem solving? Out there, probably tasks that you're given that you're supposed to Should model of, something, come up yeah. with a MySQL query, yeah. something. Yeah. Are there specific goals and rules as to what you can do in your course? Yeah. Um, are there adaptive challenges? We're not necessarily good at that, but we're trying. We try. Well, the projects. The projects, kind of. Yeah. They can be adaptive challenges. Um, do the you exercises they had at the end of the course are more challenging than the ones at the beginning. And, and, mm. and so there's the level of control. And of course, potentially, I mean, you, at the university, you get to control whether you turn up or not. Well, right. in my case, they can have five out of six, six um, exercises, yeah. which means that they can choose whether or not they're going to do all six or just the five of them, which are the five of them they're going to choose. There's ongoing feedback. The lecturer sh th throws stuff at you if you don't pay attention. That's, that's feedback. Um, and it's potentially ongoing if you've got six assessments and you get marked on five of them. Um, Uncertainty? At least the final grade is an uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> there is some uncertainty when you're doing learning, and is there sensory stimuli? You use Let's hope so. <laughs> and stand up and talk. So the problem is this: these are maybe the core elements of the game, but they're the core elements of almost all yeah, interaction. Interaction. Yeah, I systems. found them a little bit vague. Pure. Well, they're they're not wrong, but 
Yeah, so one of the discussions about the level of information or, or, or knowledge of something is, um, um, going back to computer science, is the number of possible worlds that it excludes. Right? So um, a, a, piece of, a, a, a piece of data is informative as to how many worlds it excludes. Right? So if I say a house caught fire, okay, yeah, there's a house that caught fire. You don't know very much. You know that there is now a house that has caught fire. You don't know which house, and you don't know where, and you don't know when. And so the, the potential worlds that exist that satisfy that piece of data, lots and lots. If I say my house caught fire, right, I now exclude everyone else's house from this from satisfying that equation. And I say if, if I say my house caught fire yesterday, I now give you a, a much, a, all the worlds that had my house catching fire 10 years ago or 20 years ago have been excluded. So the amount of information is how much you exclude when you make a statement rather than how much you include. So this doesn't exclude many things. Right? And so you could argue that it doesn't have a lot of information in it because it doesn't tell you what's not in the set. Uh, and these are so broad that most things will fit into this set. And so they don't really tell you very much. Um, and so, yeah, finding, finding the exclusionary things. Like, get, um, the, so the core, one of the core elements, or what are the things that are not part of the game? Right, would be as interesting or perhaps more interesting than this list of things, which are what, what is part of the game? What is not in the game? What can we say is, no, if you're doing that, you're not gaming. So that's, yeah, so these are sort of complementary ways of thinking. And in science, when we're doing falsification, you're looking for statements that you can then show are false. Right? Or you can, you're going to, is this thing true? And how we define whether it's true or not is, can I find a situation where it's false? And if I can't find any situations where it's false, then it might be true. And so when we're setting up um, uh, Popper's kind of falsification stuff, we're saying, set up a hypothesis, then try and find an experiment that makes it break. Um, and this doesn't really help a lot with that, because uh, one thing you could do is say, well, if those are all part of the game, can you find a game that doesn't have one of these? And you probably can. Okay? And can you find things that aren't games that have all of them? And you certainly do that as we did with a database course. So it yeah, the set of things that encompasses isn't isn't necessarily very aligned with what we'd like it to be. Okay, so core element. Um, so how can stealth assessment be applied to games? I was not sure. So anybody remember how it was mentioned? I, the front two, I assume you both know. <laughs> Go to that. How, how would you answer, how can self-assessment be applied to games? How would you answer that question? What would you say? If you had that on exam, what would your start be? First thing I would do is define what stealth assessment is. Right, if I was writing examples, right, so I that, okay, self self assessment is where. Give me some words, guys. Where it's kind of concrete, it's moving in, so you can't tell that it's being. Yep. Uh, can you think of, of a Common example of this in real life. Do we have stealth assessment? Or are you guys always overtly aware of when you're being seen? Game specifically, or just no, I'm thinking just anywhere in life where stealth assessment occurs. Just 
child's play. <laughs> you could look at some, well, stealth assessment. Um, interesting peer, peer assessment. Um, certainly, um, when you're out walking, right, and, um, and someone looks at you, they may be doing basically stealth assessment on the way you dress, the way you walk, the way you talk, your accent, um, the way you look. All of these things, they're not, they're not coming up to you and asking you a set of knowledge-based factual questions. But in the activity, there's constant assessment occurring. And each action you take is kind of part of an assessment. Um, job interviews. Right? Um, what, I mean, there is a, a, an overt assessment bit right, where they ask you specific questions. But there's usually uh, also this kind of stealth assessment going on where they're trying to work out what kind of person you are. They'll look at what you wear, right? There's not a thought, like there's not a, an, an, an explicit, are they wearing appropriate clothes tick kind of assessment criteria they use, but they're getting an impression. Right? So in the, and so this kind of stealth assessment occurs all the time in reality. Okay, so how do you use that in depth? Taking this uh, set of elections of players, what they will do, and uh, which part they will follow, and making the conclusion from uh, assessing them from the action. Like if a player has to cross a uh, yeah. river, if he chooses um, uh, to swim or he chooses something else, so you can assess them from the, by the action during the game. Um, which, which was one of the things I, I was thinking of. What are the major challenges with self-assessment? Um, what I so that that's what self-assessment is. Why is that so difficult? What's going to be the problem with doing it? You have to build it into the gameplay in a way, and uh, creating a gameplay that allows you to assess what, what you are looking for. If you're looking for a very specific thing, you have to create the game in a way that makes people, uh, what they have to, make, for example, make a choice or uh, and to be a bit creative to also to do that in a way that uh, that doesn't make it too apparent. Like this is what you want to find out. From yeah, them. yeah. It's 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 not too hard sometimes to see the railroading in games where. Even in entertainment games, right? Mm -hmm. When the, you, you get to a, um, like a, an, an end of level encounter, and they are kind of pushing you pretty hard into do one particular action, you know, and it feels like you're being railroaded, um, that you don't have choice, and that you don't, you've just you've just got to do this thing. Um, so, in case you, they artificially have created the barrier. Um, as people who do instructional design do assessment. Um, Writing good assessment is hard, right? And trying to keep it hidden kind of makes it harder. Right? And then incorporating it into a kind of commercial game and saying, trying to work out what this what the student is learning and how we assess that seems very game specific, right? I mean, I would have to play the game, understand all the situations, and kind of write a what's what is the student learning from this particular situation? Right. So, and um, when you're doing, did you guys study um, books in school? So, you, I mean, in New Zealand and in the UK, you read Shakespeare. Um, I assume. Analysis. Yeah, the text yeah. analysis. I'm sure there were some yeah. books that you all read, right? Now, as a teacher, what the teacher's done is they've read that book, right? And they've done text analysis on that book. So that when you do text analysis on that book, they can talk about it with you. But that's because they've read through it themselves and done the analysis. Now, that's a linear structure, so they can work through all, the whole thing. For a game, it's all over the place. The way I play through a game, slightly different to the way you guys play through a game. So how can I know where you're at and what choices you're making and what you're understanding, because I've never been there before. 
So how how do I how do I write an addition to something I've never seen? How would you guys do it? <laughs> and the, another thing is also, I mean, at least the games discussed in this paper, uh, we have these highly creative, complex games. How do you make a good assessment of complex skills? That's uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you start monitoring the immediate actions. There's a big gap between what you measure and mm -hmm. what conclusion you would like to draw. But if you look at well, in the frame of serious games, for example, the, the little game you showed us in the beginning with the Mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say it could be used for some sort of assessment to see, I don't know, to see if someone is, well, how good they are with color and if they improve. And uh, But it's, uh, well, as you said, it's an addictive game, but it's fun. Mm -hmm. But you could you probably use it to assess if someone actually gets better at, uh, well, I don't know, well, the, the point is to be able to put color up and uh, uh, this frame tool. Yeah, yeah, I know that, that's, um, that's how transferable is one of the, the yeah. again, that, that mm. transference. So, but that's very specific. Exactly. So if it's a very, uh, if it's a, a huge role playing game and you want to find some sort of stuff in there, it's probably more difficult. Well, the large role playing games often they talk about leadership and, or like group, yeah, group management and stuff. So it's, that's one of the things they're doing. Um, I know I've seen some really interesting stuff from, um, DKP, um, how how you allocate group resources to individuals contributing to that group, right? So some of my students were were, were doing raids, and um, yeah, they work out some very complex um, contribution and uh, yeah and allocation strategies for when you get an X amount of money, the forty of you fighting a, 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 a fighting a, a big enemy. And you're all slightly different and different levels with different capabilities. How do you allocate those resources to the people, right? And that's a really complex, interesting problem. And so there were some really interesting strategies and discussions, and, and these people were learning something really important about how you manage resources and people's contributions. But I know it's kind of very specific to that game. And different guilds had different solutions. Some went with very simple solutions, and so would you say those people are less creative, or are you saying, well, no, they've 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 gone through and made and thought about all those complex ones and ended up with a simple solution? Um, one of my favourite ones is the if you look at competing in, in competitive environments, there's the um, defect or cooperate. Right? Do you if we have an interaction, do I stab you in the back and take all the stuff, or do I share with you? Right? This is a one of the standard defect cooperate things. Um, and in most of the virtual simulations, they find that tit for tat is the best strategy. Right? You start by collaborating and you share. And then if somebody steals from you, then you steal from them. If they cooperate with you, you cooperate with them. Right? And, she did, and, and it beats most of the other complex strategies. It's just simple tit for tat. So sometimes a simple solution isn't evidence of a person not understanding the complexity. It may be that that is the best and most elegant solution to the problem. And so the, the part of how you got to a piece of evidence is missing if you only use evidence. Right? So, like for example, I, I don't use any of the transitions in PowerPoint. Right? Not because I don't know how to use the transitions in PowerPoint, but because for me, most of the transitions extract from what I'm trying to do. So my use of the transitions in PowerPoint would indicate that I am a simplistic user of PowerPoint. Yeah, the, the evidence doesn't but, capture my... But the frenzy transitions are okay. <laughs> I don't use rotation very much in Prezi at all. Right? A lot of people use the rotation in Prezi. I, I very rarely use the rotation. I use it very specifically and, and only when I intend to have a mental curve where I want the endpoints to be closer than a linear. Right? So 
So I don't just use it randomly to rotate things around. It's if I want a group of things where I think the end one is closer, yeah, they're, they're non-linear, then I'll use a curve. While things are linear, I'll, use, I'll just use it horizontally. But yeah, I specifically use transitions in a very specific way. And the same for zooming. I only zoom in when I think an area is smaller than another area. Right? So I don't just randomly use the transition. But again, I would be considered a simple Prezi user because I don't use the rotation much and I don't use zooming a lot and, and those sort of things. But yeah, so evidence is a tricky one. Okay, so um, what is the problem with using games to teach complex content? Competence, competency, competencies, competency, competence. I'm not sure if competence is. is. Yeah, <laughs> competencies. Um, I'm not sure how you say it or if. <laughs> but yes, yeah. so what's the, what's, the, what's the challenge? What's the problem with using games? I think it's mainly that, uh, well, for some cases, it is the specific kind of information mm -hmm. what you've learned just from, like, on a simple curve or, or with a data that is in your head. You know, so you want to, yeah, so it, it's hard to get, like, quick results on whether or not it, you actually learn from the information. <laughs> The nice thing about multi choice is that you can complete the task first and you get an individual mark. And this is why I say lectures kind of have evolved with examinations because we say something in a lecture, we know we said it, then we ask you, do you remember me saying that? And if you do, then you get a mark. Um, which is this is also a question of coverage and with traditional mm -hmm. lecturing and more linear approach and to mention the uh, multiple choice, you can cover. You can say, okay, it covers this much of the course, and we have spent so much time on each of them. But then you have a game, and it's all up to the player to decide where to go and what to focus on. Coverage, how much do they actually touch base and, and cover, is, is kind of difficult to make sure that they go everywhere they need to go to get to all the competence, especially when it's complex. You need both, both settings and yeah, so when I mean, if you were if you're wanting to check if everybody was out of the building um, when the fire alarm goes off, your best way is probably a linear search through the building. Just and divide them uh, in, in the, in the uh, stories of uh, parts of the building and just yep. go through. work through them all, right? If you want to cover something that broad and wide, you kind of you pick a path that goes through it all. Um, but games tend to give you choice, and so you go and find where they're interesting, and so you kind of avoid a whole bunch of stuff. So, so I think, yes, how do you... Yeah, that's one of the problems, is that the coverage is quite tricky. And then the, the transfer as well. So some complex behaviors in a particular context are not easily transferable to another context, and you are not guaranteed that a person learned how to do that. So solving particular problems in that context doesn't mean you kind of acquired a general problem solving in another context. Mm. It might, it may not, so. That's, that's one of the criticisms I have of, of, of actually traditional education has, has similar challenges. Yeah. Um, when you guys get taught things in very compartmentalized mental models, you tend to do a subject in isolation as a kind of silo, and then you do another one over here, and you do another one over here, and you don't integrate them across. Um, games are good at kind of integrating across, but not good at building up the depth of the silo. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, which makes some of these quite challenging. Yeah, because I, I think, like with traditional teaching, you have problems with the complex competencies as well. So the games are not disadvantaged. Actually, I think there are, uh, there are advantages of using games for that because of the broader natural interactions. It's, it's much harder to teach simple things in games 
because then they become really boring. Like if you try to, to really teach one particular thing through a game, typically that's, that will be a challenge. Mm. <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah. So, we're done with it. Should we have a break? Yes, break.